Welcome, listeners, to the Information Nation, brought to you by the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, Division of Fish and Wildlife, Hunter Education Program. As always, I'm the host and Hunter Education Coordinator for the state of Rhode Island, Scott Travers. As always, we are coming to you from the Outdoor Education Office in Exeter, Rhode Island, and our focus is on hunting, hunter education, fishing, aquatic education, and all things wildlife outreach related in the state of Rhode Island. Today we're here with Connor McManus for the second half of our podcast, which we were originally covering the Marine Division and what's going on with sharks in the state of Rhode Island. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, of course, I'm I'm sure you're aware shark sightings have been really prevalent in the news in Rhode Island uh, this summer. So can you tell us something about the presence of sharks in Rhode Island waters? Sure. I think what I'll first start by saying is that I don't necessarily think the presence of sharks has increased, you know, from five years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago. I think what we're what we're really doing now, I think, in my opinion, is doing a better job of documenting what is here. Um, And by doing so, uh, it's good to highlight for folks that this work does not necessarily dictate that there's more. The, the, The work is trying to help educate people on what's in our state waters and it's something that, as a department, we haven't done quite extensively in the past. And so we've really tried to collect resources and partnerships and um, together with, with various new assets and, and, um, and colleagues to get a better understanding of um, the shark ecology in Rhode Island. Um, we've been lucky in that we've had really great both recreational and commercial harvester collaborations through time that have let us know like when they see a white shark or when they see a sand tiger shark or an abnormal amount of spinner sharks coming through but we haven't used the 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 more modern scientific tools up until now to really document who's where and finally we built we're or i would say we're starting to build a more robust program that allows us to do so gotcha so it's really more a, a matter of what we do and our monitoring and our science has gotten better I, I believe so, um, humbly. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, yes, I think that you know to date, I wouldn't. I would say that in the example of white sharks, they have been in Rhode Island for years. It's not. This isn't a new phenomenon. When we see, uh, when we find that white sharks have been detected on an acoustic receiver coming through Block Island, um, I I firmly believe that sharks have moved through Block Island for many many years. Um, and so the question is now getting a better understanding of that footprint uh, and the tools that we have now are trying to better understand uh, for the t- for all the, for the animals that are tagged out there by other colleagues of ours up and down the, the u.s states um, who what species actually move through here um, of those species what size are they you know and and um, and how big are they uh, when do they come through and when do they leave and then additionally where are they uh, there are certain areas within Rhode Island that seem to be more uh, preferred habitat or maybe a, a really important part of their uh, life history where they come through here because that's where the food is or because the temperature is correct or because the depth and the, the habitat there uh, supports a certain life history trait of theirs. So, um, you know, to date with this kind of acoustic receiver monitoring that listens, quote unquote, for um, tagged fish moving through the region, um, you know, we've been able to detect a wide variety of species that have been tagged by researchers for all different types of questions, um, including um, including white sharks, sand tiger sharks, sandbar sharks, bluefin tuna. Um, striped bass is probably the most common species we see on our receivers, um, but we've seen other things like river herring tagged. Again, just getting a better documentation of Sharks are always kind of the species that everyone's interested in, and particularly because they're so hard to monitor in other traditional fisheries gear. We we don't catch them all the time in our trawl survey, or we don't catch them a lot in our pot surveys. But this is one of the tools that's used prominently to understand their movement, movement ecology, and uh, as a result, get a lot of attention. But this is this tool is used for fluke and black sea bass and uh, winter flounder and a lot of the other species that we um, are interested in recreationally. Right, gotcha. So, uh, do you think that climate change um, possibly affecting uh, maybe an increase in their food sources closer to shore? Do you think that might be a factor? Um, it depends on the species, for sure. You know, I okay. think something like the white shark—it's a—it's uh, both per, uh, function of 
a slight increase or a steady increase in abundance compounded by a steady increase in their in their prey concurrently right. and then you also have the idea of of where these two intersect or really where the prey aggregates and the and thus where the predator the white shark then goes to feed as that is the habitat that supports its um, nutrition right? right so in an area like cape cod in the south on the outer edge uh, chatham you know provincetown areas where the seals oftentimes will come and be in the summer um, that obviously becomes an area that's highly suitable for white sharks based on nutrition and being able to right. being able to feed so there is certainly this aspect of we might see increases in a shark species in a given area in a given area rather but does that necessarily mean that the whole atlantic ocean population of atlantic white sharks has increased it's those two are not necessarily correlated because it may just be a certain area is now more habitable uh, and so we don't understand we haven't done um the science has not covered every aspect within their in their stock range as to how that's changed but from the little data we do have you know there is evidence to suggest there might be a small increase in white sharks but not to the extent of uh what we've seen at, at cape cod where it's a function of prey changes in abundance the white shark abundance habitat aggregation a lot of these things are are um are coming together that allow it to be a more prolific species in this area. Right, right. So what type of sharks are typically found in Rhode Island? So I think in the coastal areas, oftentimes, um, certainly white sharks, particularly juveniles, will move through. Um, they can they can come here at various times of the year, but our data would suggest June, July, August is when, in May is when they would push through, late May. Um, we have seen things like sand tiger sharks for sure. Smaller, they're a smaller shark. They like uh, shallow, murky waters where they'll feed on crabs and such. Um, sandbar sharks too are a species that um, we haven't seen tons of, but they they can come through um, some of our state's waters. And then you have the the larger, more pelagic sharks that um, our rec our recreational community probably would interact with more, like blue sharks and thresher sharks, and short fin makos. Um, probably less certainly i think less abundant within state waters than your than those other species because they're more pelagic they rely on the open ocean a bit more but those th we certainly see thresher sharks push through here as probably those have seen in the news you know one off narragansett beach this year one off moonstone beach and other uh, um, one off matunic or um as well as westerly so there are these species like that that can be pelagic but then also can come in the shore and feed on menhaden and things of that nature um, but we also can see from time to time blue sharks and makos uh, particularly if an ocean front moves in or the prey moves in abruptly um, that allows them to come in and feed um, there's also this dichotomy of what we see on the mainland side narragansett bay uh, matunic uh, the, the mainland if you will versus block island which is positioned in an area where uh, closer to the Gulf Stream, where you get more of these um, summer migrants that might come through as the Gulf Stream pushes in closer to shore in the, in the months of August and September. And that's where you can get some other cool animals like um, like like uh, hammerhead sharks that sometimes we'll see off the southern side of, of Block Island coming through. Um, and, you know, occasionally we'll see other cool things like spinner sharks and other animals that um, that are either just outside of state waters off the island or just inside um, but there's a lot of shark species out there and rhode island is depending on the year can be home to a dozen or more different species of shark no oh, that's really interesting wow so do most of these sharks pose a threat to people uh i would say no i mean i think generally speaking the sharks don't want to deal with you just as much as you don't want to deal with them, you know? So uh, generally speaking, I would say no. With that said, you know, at DEM, we're very cognizant that these these are um, high trophic level predators, you know, that, that feed on fish and can and have obviously mistaken people for fish in the past or seals. So, um, you know, we do work as an agency to try and promote public safety. And that's, in my opinion, starts with the right information, including safety precautions and the scientific data to inform what might what might be out there uh, when you see a fin what is it you know and 
uh, using precaution when you see these things and making sure people are safe. So, um, you know, generally speaking, the white shark has been one that's always um, highlighted as could be, um, you know, predatory and a risk to public safety. And it could, it certainly could be the case. We've seen fatalities around the world because of it, but they're very rare. And, you know, we try to use precautions when we're looking at these areas to make sh just to ensure. But the change in risk through time, I don't believe has changed in terms of um, being able to use the beaches and, right. and that nature. Gotcha. So how can um, the common person um, or someone who's not necessarily, you know, a marine uh, fishery specialist, uh, how could they tell the difference between sharks if they see them? Or is there a resource perhaps that they could go to? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and I think, it, again, coming back to education and outreach and getting people both interested in and also um, aware of what they're looking at is always a goal of ours. This summer, particularly, not only due to our safety protocols that we're trying to put in place at beaches, but then also just at the education tools, we're starting to build flyers and pamphlets at our state beaches that then allow people to do quick identifications. So if they see a fin that's a triangle but flopping back and forth they can they can then say to themselves that's more likely a sunfish or a mola mola than a shark even though it's up straight you know the shark fin doesn't necessarily flop you know so that's likely a mola mola and maybe the safety um risk is not the same is not that uh initial perceived height right um and then similarly you know dolphins you know th what the shape of their fin looks like how they move through the water up and down that also gives the viewer to say, okay, it's not a shark fin, it's a dolphin. And um, then it goes into certain species, of course, which gets ch more challenging. Some are rather easy, like the fresher, with a really long tail that you can see flopping, and it can be as long as its entire body. It's pretty easy to say then, okay, this is a fresher shark. But then some things, like you know, off the Cape, they have both basking sharks and great whites. The former eats plankton, and the latter eats seals. So you have two from species that from afar look very similar with the fin um to, to, the, to the general public but have very different feeding behavior and right. di very different risk levels so right. um you know we do work to try and, and and there's other information out there whether it's via um the massachusetts division of marine fisheries or or noaa in terms of being able to id species and, and fin shape and such but um admittedly as you get towards some of the species that look closer together from afar by fin you're looking for more nuanced differences such as on the back side of the dorsal fin do you see ridges does it come down sharp is it how big is it compared to what the perceived body length that you can see at the surface so it gets a little bit more challenging um, but there are a few things particularly with mola mola that's one of the more common ones we get um, over, and threshers, you know, those are the two that we in Rhode Island have had the public observe the most in recent years. So even those couple of quick things allow one to quickly be able to say it's a thresher, don't go near it, but it's not a white shark. And then, or mola mola, I can probably keep swimming, um, pursuant to the guidelines at DEM, whether the, depending on the lifeguards, um, um, ability to also, uh, recognize that. Right, right. So, um, what should someone do if they see a shark in Rhode Island waters? Is there a number they could call? Um, so, yeah. So I guess if you're at a state beach, the first thing you should do is go to your lifeguard and let them know. Again, we've worked really hard with uh, the Parks and Recreation Division enforcement um, as well to try and build a plan of which we can use to promote public safety. So if you're at a state beach, the first and foremost, you would report the sighting to your uh, lifeguard of which then they can look to try and get a picture if they can see get a good shot make an id or contact marine fisheries and enforcement to relay this information for an educational decision on whether to keep the beaches open or closed um, so that's the first thing i would do but you know as well you know people are are free to call or email the division of marine fisheries with an observation of, of a certain species and that's not just for sharks, anything neat, because um, I think that's a lot, very informative citizens for citizens in science to help us get a better understanding of what's here, what's not here, the ecology, time of year, you know, for a lot of these different species that, um, you know, with a staff of 25 people, we're not on the water everywhere all the time. So right. it's really uh, helpful for us, even in the context of public safety, just in addition to that, better understanding our waters and perhaps how they're changing. 
Gotcha. And what, what would that phone number be for the people to call? Um, you could call the our front desk if you'd like uh, at 401-423-1923 or 1920. Both would get you there. Um, and that, and you know, we what we do is try and um, document these things through time. Again, it helps us just as it's just like in these conversations, being able to speak to our hammerheads off Block Island or not, or do spinner sharks come through here ever? And so we get these reports, and it's really helpful for us to then not necessarily uh, be able to act on it um, immediately, but just get a better understanding of our ecosystem and what's happening, and perhaps anticipation of whether a new species is coming or whether uh, it's just um, another piece of data that we can use to inform our our understanding of Rhode Island marine species diversity. Right, right. And you mentioned um, those ID pamphlets. Um, would people be able to use that same phone number to get one of those pamphlets if they were interested? Um, at this point, they're primarily with our outreach team um, with DEM, and then ideally will be physical copies at the beaches but also ideally we will have those online as well for people to read and download gotcha okay. those those also work through a little bit about the park system um at beaches what certain flags mean if there's a flag up you know just getting a sense of that means you're out of the water you're in the water or you can go in the water i should say um it also speaks to some of the common species that we have in rhode island it and it talks it speaks to when you see a fin what it might look like and what uh, if you see a fin what is it doing? Give you some of these kind of walkthroughs. If it's doing this, it's probably that, you know, and give you a little bit of understanding there. And then additionally, um, it goes through a little bit about the science that we're doing as part of DEM to let the public know we're looking to collect data to help inform not just global, uh, our global and regional understanding of sharks, which is important for their sustainability, but then also to help inform how we manage our beaches and get a better understanding of probability of certain species being in certain areas and that way we have both educated um, staff and lifeguards but then also public right now we had a question from one of our listeners uh, who asked what can someone do to protect themselves against sharks in the water sure and i guess i would say you know generally speaking swimming at beaches is perfectly safe like i would say that any perceived risk with more shark week stuff or more information on sharks being tagged I, I don't i don't believe that there's any real increase in risk in recent years but if people wanted to protect themselves or be uh, further protect themselves or be even more comfortable swimming you know i would say you know typically the white sharks will feed at dawn and dusk you know it, it would be ideal to then not swim at those times um, furthermore um, trying to make it so you're not looking exactly like a seal is also like wetsuits and things have often been discussed. Um, additionally, um, trying to make sure that you're not swimming alone. You know, those are, th those are some safety tips and that, um, that, uh, have are often implemented globally in terms of trying to make sure that you're swimming, um, safer than you normally would. But, um, you know, in general, I would say, you know, for most of the species that we're seeing, um, uh, very few of them, are have been known to be predatory towards humans particularly uh, when unantagonized un un right you now and it sounds like education is, is key as well to know what's out there and you can tell a lot by the the fin that you see in the water absolutely and i think you know one of the interesting things we learned this year is what you know there was first for whichever reason more ids or occurrences of of thresher sharks at some of these highly utilized beaches, whether they be state or town owned. And it's been a, a nice opportunity to educate people on thresher sharks as an example. Why is their big tail used? What, what are they doing here? What is their perceived risk of, of interacting with humans um, in a predatory fashion, which is very different than a white shark. So it, it allows people to get understand the nuances of these species and again, perceived risks. I, I would just say that, you know, we've worked as a department to try and um, make sure we maintain public safety at all these beaches and um, in some instances be um, overly precautious in trying to make sure that's maintained for um, continued and indefinite uh, use and pleasure at the beaches. Right. I understood. So what is the Atlar Atlantic Shark Institute and what do they do? Um, so they are uh, a nonprofit organization led by John Dodd, um, who's been a collaborator of ours dating back to 2019 now. Um, 
we've worked on a number of different things together, um, pr primarily in a scientific fashion. So uh, DEM Marine Fisheries and the Atlantic Shark Institute collectively have built this acoustic receiver um, array is what we call it, or um, number of receivers in the water listening throughout all of state waters, whether it be in Upper Narragansett Bay or on the out off Westerly, uh, off Watch Hill, or off the south coast of Block Island. And so it, I think that's a it's a prime example of entities joined together, po pooling resources to really create a better scientific product than either one could do alone. Um, so that's and so we've had this receiver array that listens to all types of fish, including sharks that were not tagged by us coming through. And then again, working with other academics, state agencies, federal scientists um, to understand uh, the movement ecology for all these different animals. We've also have a number of different um, uh, surveys going on with them in collaboration, whether they be using video or directed tagging effort for some of these common recreational sharks like blue, fit, blue sharks, shortfin mako, thresher sharks, actually tagging the animal. So when it comes by our receivers, we, we can detect it. Um, and then and then using other types of tag technology for some of these sharks like satellite tags on blue sharks where it doesn't need to swim by the receiver for us to know where it is. Every time it pops to the surface, it sends a little signal up to the satellites. And well, we can, it's and incredible. We can track it. Yeah. yeah, so we've been using a number of these different tools. And again, each of us chipping in little amounts to really create a, a big amount and then also ultimately a successful product that can be used not only to inform the science and the stock assessments of these animals um, and, and their management, but then also just for the recreational or interested member of, of on uh, fishery science or fish ecology. I think right, that's right. And, and do you have any other partners? Um, does URI contribute to, the, to this project? Um, we do, the URI has contributed as well, particularly in the acoustic receiver compo component of it. You know, um, originally... Rhode Island DEM and URI had constructed this receiver array, you know, to try and understand, the, you know, out the gate, um, Atlantic sturgeon, and which which is another species we see come through on this array. It's endangered, um, which and again, it's rarely intercepted by traditional monitoring tools. So the acoustic receivers really provide valuable data of when and where the species may be coming through Rhode Island. So URI was uh, paramount in get helping us as a state agency get off the ground with uh, the original nine receivers we put in through time we've um, ourselves have then been able to try and invest more and in more receivers to listen for more species and answer other questions in addition to striped bass such as um, when are striped bass coming in and leaving and should that help us inform maybe when a striped bass season starts and ends you know for recreational anglers and really give us data to help us understand that uncertainty every annually so we're trying to be more creative as we get this new data, how it can be used to help Rhode Islanders as well in terms of when are fish here and how should we structure management that allows for us to maximize our um, the resource opportunities for people, again, ensuring that it's done sustainably. Right, right. That's amazing. I didn't realize the array picked up so much data from even different species. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things where, again, it's all acoustically driven. You base If you can... Imagine it, it looks, the, the receiver looks like a, a heavy water bottle that will rig up to buoys and lines and weights and they sit in the water. Um, and then any, any species that's tagged with an acoustic transmitter compatible with the receiver, which most in the science community are of this type of technology, will be picked up. Um, a lot of the work we are doing with URI2 is understanding the physics of what allows a species to be detected. Um, whether you place the receiver in deep water or in shallow water, or up in the bay versus out front, um, warm, cold months, like all those factor into whether a fish can be detected uh, a kilometer away from the receiver or 500 meters away from the receiver. Right. So again, it's a, as we dive into this, it, like classic science, you try and address one question and 10 more pop up. Um, <laughs> but, but we continue to try and um, again, as we learn more about the species and the technology, um, try and again collect better data than we've previously had to help again educate the public inform um, the species science just as, as as scientists trying to help understand stocks as well as an ideally management and opportunities to um, 
fully utilize the resources that's available. Gotcha. Excellent. Well, wow, that's really fantastic. There's a lot of great information. Um, is there anything that maybe we haven't covered um, in terms of the shark presence in Rhode Island that, that you might want to mention? Or um, I think um, in general, I just for sharks, I like to let people know that they're um, they're really exciting creatures for sure. They have a lot of notoriety um, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, but you know, generally, I think you know that in many ways, I as a as a marine animal enthusiasts i would guess i would say you know they're 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 valuable to the ecosystem just like our black sea bass just like our lobster and important to rhode islanders you know um there are people who who directly you know will look to recreationally fish for sharks either um for you know enjoyment or for nourishment so i think in many ways you know with eem i look at our involvement in the shark work as trying to better provide science to our constituents who um, either their businesses or their li- or their um, lifestyle interact with the species. Right. So, um, you know, in generally speaking, you know, I, I wanted to also highlight that a lot of the shark work we do has also been in collaboration with party and charter captains who are on the water all the time, and they can help us deploy a tag, or they can help us say, you know, there's a uh, um, there's a school of fish moving through, and we saw a bunch of blue sharks yesterday in this general area. So. They've been really great um, partners as well in this endeavor, um, and ideally, you know, the information that we collect from all this work is also valuable to them, both in terms of their just um, j- long-standing interest in the species, but then also um, just in terms of maybe in their businesses, and just understanding again the importance of different ru- re- regulations or learning where fish are, you know, and and how that may influence their fishing practices. So. Um, they've been really stellar partners. Um, you know, a lot of the work, just like with the Institute, we couldn't do without. Um, so, um, you know, it, we, we look forward to doing more uh, co- uh, cooperative research in this fashion with, on all of our different managed species. Oh, excellent. Cool. Yeah, maybe we'll have you back again at some point in the future to give an update. You bet. Cool, cool. So before we uh, let you go, we always ask all our guests for one funny or memorable story from the field. So what do you have for us? <laughs> well, I, yeah. So I, I mean, for me particularly, um, you know, over over my career, I would say, I guess, you know, be I've been I've been really fortunate to do a lot of different type of work, whether it's assisting on trawl surveys or running pot surveys, scuba diving, and under and understanding fish communities with different habitats, or you know, looking for or or shark fishing and um, cod fishing, you know. Um, I guess, you know, funny th- stories, um, I get, well, I guess I'll say interesting stuff is always when you're doing that stuff and you catch something rare, always very cool. So to me, um, you know, we've shark, we've done some shark tagging work and have c- run into, um, odd animals in the past, like hammerheads or dusky sharks that are rarer than some of the other sharks that we've talked about today. Um, like blues, makos, threshers in our area. Um, I, th- I think in terms of funny stories, I, I guess I-, I would think more so about just uh, all field work is relied on teamwork, you know, and all of us sit very interested and love what we do, g- agree and are excited about the mission. And then the rest is like the laughs that we have while doing it, whether it's funny goofs or jokes or um, ex- shared experiences through these efforts. Um you know, I think one of our surveys that we that's a good example of this, but certainly not the only one, is our lobster settlement survey, where um, we look every year between August and September for newly settled lobsters that were larvae and eggs not even two months prior and have recently settled to give us an understanding of what lobsters stocks will look like in eight years when they're older. And it's a scuba dive survey where we're literally vacuuming the bottom of the seafloor and um, a lot of team camaraderie getting it done um uh you know oftentimes we'll try and uh wear hawaiian shirts on (laughs) on fridays in this throughout the summer and we'll throw those on when we're underwater um (laughs) so you know i think um you know in terms of uh certain goofs and such you know i don't i don't know if i have a specific one but i think there are certainly many memories of laughing and and uh basically all predicated off of teamwork and right. working with great people in the department. Yeah, that's what it's all about. You know, and that's, I don't think I've talked to anyone um, from Fish and Wildlife that hasn't also, you know, been a real great enthusiast 
for the things that they do professionally. I, I tell people a lot um, in our professions of, you know, resource management that I th- we're just so lucky to have people who are so dedicated and look at this as a career, you know, and look at this as trying to make a positive impact. I think, you know, with that in mind, it's awesome. You know, like it, it, you're right there. Everybody's on the same page and it oftentimes solicits really awesome personalities as well right. and people who are about um you know being able to uh, laugh and joke but then also serious about what they do and um and then of course then adaptable and willing to compromise and willing to um you know um, meet in the middle and and help each other out i mean and lend a hand i think all that is at least in my experience that's 99 percent of the people that um, are attracted and end up in resource management. Right, yeah, because there's so much that you end up taking on. It's particularly, I always tell people, um, in, in context to other states too, I'm not as, as familiar with um, how it is for wildlife, but for marine fisheries, we're a small group compared to neighboring states. And I think oftentimes um, we get a lot done for the, for the size of the program that we have, which is um, I'm really proud of, um, but is all, again, only predicated off of a good team. And uh, luckily, that's what we have in DEM. Absolutely. Excellent. Well stated. Fantastic. So um, how can our listeners get in touch with you if they had any specific questions or things that we might not have covered? Absolutely. Um, So you can um, reach me probably the best by email. Um, So that's, I'll spell it out. It's just my name, um, C-O-N-O-R dot M-C-M-A-N-U-S at D-E-M dot R-I dot gov. Um, and, uh, yeah, any more questions myself or the marine fisheries team will be happy to get in touch with you to, um, talk about things or show you where some of the information can be found on our website. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Connor. It was a pleasure having you again. Thanks for having me and, um, look forward to myself and or the marine fisheries team, uh, contributing in the future. Oh, fantastic. So for our listeners, next month's topic is going to be our Division of Fish and Wildlife's new upland game biologist named Alex Fish, who's going to be talking about all things upland game bird related in Rhode Island, including the health of the Rhode Island's native upland game bird population and anything you ever wanted to know about the stocking of upland game birds in the state of Rhode Island. We'll also have more questions for our listeners. And if you have any questions for any of our guests or any of our staff, you can always email me at scott.travers at dem.ri.gov. So please remember to subscribe and share our podcast. And until next time, as always, we encourage our listeners everywhere to get outside and enjoy the wonderful outdoor world and natural resources that we all share in the beautiful state of Rhode Island.